Today we're going to cover, I think, maybe one of the most ambitious subjects that we've ever tried to tackle in, in one sitting. This is a subject that we addressed briefly, actually multiple times. I looked through my notes. We did talk about it briefly several months ago, um, actually in two different classes. We tackled it from different angles than that we're going to address it uh, today. But also today we're going to try to really cover this very, this very exhaustive, comprehensive, vexing question, vexing dilemma of Jewish philosophy. It's a huge subject. There are loads of variables. There's many, many sources, conflicting opinions. It really is a mess. And what we're going to try to do today is to provide clarity into this complex subject. And I want to begin with the following disclaimer. I don't want to suggest that the perspective that we're going to share is the sole legitimate approach to this very difficult subject. But as we shall see, and I'm going to make extra effort to try to cite my sources, there's definitely reputable, substantial positions backing the way we're going to try to simplify and organize this subject. And I think it's a, it's a natural flow from the, from the topic that we talked about last time. Last time we spoke about principle number five of the 13 principles of faith, namely the idea that God alone is worthy of our worship. We pray to God, to God directly and not via intermediaries. And that, of course, is part of a larger concept, the idea that the Jewish definition of God is the God that's involved with the lives of, of human folk and maybe even of, of animals. But the, the world is not divorced, it's not severed from God. So the concept of, of prayer and of divine oversight is really part of the same larger construct. The problem is, well, I'll just to get right to it, uh, there seems to be an obvious paradox throughout Jewish philosophy. And that is that on one hand, we talk about what's called Hashkacha Pratit, personal oversight, divine providence on one hand. God is overseeing our lives, is intervening when necessary, is manipulating events, is involved in the minutia, is micromanaging what happens to us. Yet on the other hand, of course, the central pillar of, of Torah is the fact that we have a say, is the fact that we can choose to veer one way or the other. We have free will, our actions matter, and even... The idea of, of the laws of nature, the, the fixed, rigid rules that the Almighty baked into his world, those also have a say in determining what happens to us. So there's got to be a point where those two meet. You know, who is in charge of man, what happens to man? When I say man, I mean mankind. Is it God? And we're saying, we, we say that it's solely God. God is involved in every aspect of our lives. Yet we say that we have a say. Our free will choices matter. The free will choices of other people also matter. They also influence what happens to to us and the laws of nature too have a say and they play a role in in determining what happens to humanity. And that's the paradox because on one hand, the Talmud, for example, tells us – and by the way, we're going to be quoting many sources – but these, this is a small selection but we tried to get a nice cross-section of the sources – but there are many more. But the Talmud in the book of Chul in page 7 tells us that a person doesn't injure their small finger from below unless it was thus decreed from above. Which again, it's part of the general idea. The Almighty is overseeing. The Almighty is giving the divine providence. What happens to man is determined by God, even on the most minute of levels. Yet, of course, there is the laws of nature, the free will, the free will of others. That too plays a role and those, there has to be a point where those two meet because is God determining what happens to us? Am I doing it myself? Am I at the whims of other people? Are we subject to the laws of nature? Nature has, plays its course. It has its role to play. I'm going to try to untangle all this in one sitting. So like we said, it's ambitious. So I want to give a few background sources uh, before we get into the meat and potatoes, before we get into the uh, the heart of the matter. I think a beautiful source to to kick things off is the Talmud of the book of Sanhedrin. Talmud tells us the following shocking statement, the book of Sanhedrin, page 37b. From the day the temple was destroyed, 
even though the Sanhedrin dissolved, even though the Jewish system of courts dissolved, and of course the Jewish system of courts would oversee capital punishment, and there's four kinds of capital punishment for different classes of sinners, and even though the Sanhedrin is no longer with us, the four capital punishments are still present. Tom was like, wait a minute, what did you just say? How could you say that the four methods of capital punishment are still present? They're not. There hasn't been anyone executing a Jewish court of law in thousands of years. Says so the Talmud, no. It doesn't mean that the actual four kinds of, of et- methods of execution are, are still present. It means that the ideas of them are still present. Someone who is supposed to get stoned, they fall off a roof. Someone who's supposed to get burned, well, they, they, they die in a fire. Or maybe a, a snake comes and bites them and the venom consumes them from within. Someone who's supposed to get beheaded, they get caught up with the Romans, the Romans behead them, or maybe a bunch of thieves do that. Finally, the fourth method of execution is asphyxiation. Someone who is supposed to die in that way is going to drown or have some other illness that is equivalent of asphyxiation. What the Talmud is telling us is that, yes, there was a, a modality in which people who committed heinous and unconscionable sins were punished in specific ways. And you know what? Though That went away, but God is still going to make sure that everyone gets their due. And therefore, if someone dies, who, who caused them to die in that particular way was God because they deserved it because of their behavior. So again, an idea of, of someone dying in a very specific way, specifically because of their behavior, and it fits into the, to the model of the four methods of execution. That's what the Talmud says. Another example, Talmud of Makros tells us, you have two people, both of them are murderers, one of them killed willfully, but there weren't witnesses or the witnesses weren't sufficient. One of them killed accidentally and likewise there were no witnesses. Someone who kills willfully, well, that's a capital crime. Someone who kills accidentally, well, they're supposed to go into exile. If there's a punishment accorded to someone who killed as, kills accidentally as well. How does the Almighty provide justice to this situation? Well, he makes that these two people happen to meet in the same resort. And one of them... The person who killed willfully is suntanning by the beach. And the other person is there fixing the roof and he goes up the ladder. And he killed accidentally and he's climbing the ladder. And then he misses a rung and he falls down and he crushes to death the person who's supposed to die. And he kills him accidentally and now there's a whole band of onlookers. So everyone gets their due. The person who killed willfully needs to die, dies. The person who kills accidentally needs to go to exile. Well, now this time, in this round, there are witnesses and they go to exile. That's what the Talmud says. Now, what this means specifically, it's always important to separate the specifics of the general principle that's being conveyed here. The general principle that is being conveyed here is that everyone's going to get their due. The Almighty is going to arrange the chess pieces so that everyone is going to get what, what what is appropriate for them. So you may think this is a terrible accident. No, it's not a terrible accident. Actually, the person who's supposed to die, died, and this was all done perfectly. This is not an accident. This is actually the direct handiwork of God. That's a theme, of course, that we see elsewhere in Jewish philosophy, in Jewish in Jewish life. You know, we just went through the high holidays, and we have on Yom Kippur Rosh Hashanah the idea that we declare that on Rosh Hashanah it's going to be determined who's going to live and who's going to die. And on Yom Kippur, that verdict is sealed, and subsequently it's delivered. And over the course of the year, whatever was predestined on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur plays out over the course of the year. When someone dies, there is a tradition to quote the verse in Scripture, the Almighty gives Hashem Nas and Hashem Lakach, the Almighty takes away. We're declaring that, again, the Almighty is overseeing people's lives and, of course, people's passing. The Talmud, the book of Sachem, page 54b, tells us, that there are seven things that are hidden from the eyes of man, and one of them is the day of someone's death. Only God knows when someone's going to die, and only God oversees that. He alone, Memesu Mechaia, the Almighty kills, and the Almighty makes people live. The, these are things that are solely in the hands of God. And of course, there's many sources. We're just giving a sampling. Uh, the Talmud, the book of Nita, page 31a, tells us every person, there's three partners, the Father, the Mother, and the Almighty. The Father, Mother, they provide, of course, some of the biology, 
And the Talmud lists the things that the father provides, what's on the Y chromosome, what's on the X chromosome. And of course, God animates the person. The fact that they could think, that they could, they could talk, they could walk, that's all the handiwork of God. That's all the gift of God. And then what happens when it's time for someone to pass? Then the Almighty takes what he contributed and leaves what the parents contribute. So the, the, the body is still there. The biology is still there. It's just not alive. It's just a paperweight. The parents' contribution is still present, but God's contribution is taken away. Again, we see this theme, this general theme, that the Almighty is involved in a very intimate way, a very direct way, with what happens to people. Now, I'm just throwing this out there. I don't want to follow down this rabbit hole. But what happens when someone commits a homicide? What would we say? This is a, it's a, it's a troubling question. A person A commits a crime, the worst crime possible, murders person B. Person B is dead. Did God want person B dead? Or did person A override the will of God? Again, that, that, that's to the heart of our question. Who is in charge? We see, we see, seems to see, not, would anyone here say that the person is, is, uh, is not guilty when they commit such a horrendous crime? We all say instinctively this is, this is the handiwork of the criminal. Yet, on the other side, conversely, we're, we're saying that it's God who decides who lives and who dies. I'm not going to give an answer to this question. Maybe it'll, it'll, it'll emerge throughout our discussion. But it's very hard for us to say that God is in charge of determining who lives and who dies, yet the murderer is to blame. Maybe, maybe they should be given plaudits. They're, after all, executing quite literally the will of God. So, so which one is it? So I'm just throwing that out there, that there is a, there's a whole class of questions that we could ask when we see something that ostensibly is the handiwork of God. In our eyes, it's the handiwork of man. Which one is it? Is it both? Is it, is it God wanted them dead and this is the tool that he's using? Or no, the God wanted them alive and the person is, the criminal is the one who's taking matters into their own hands and, and commit, committing an atrocity and God allows such atrocities to happen, which is, which creates its own, of course, theological dilemmas. So that's just to open up the, the conversation. I think there's uh, other areas where this question surfaces. So, for example, in a less dramatic case, you have someone who is ill. What do you do when you're ill? You go to the doctor. Everyone does it. That's a normal thing to do. Can't we say that God made you ill and that going to the doctor is not going to help you at all? Should you go to the doctor? Is going to the doctor a lack of faith? Interesting question. What about making a living? Should you go to college? Should you say, well, I'm at the will. The Almighty decides who becomes rich and who doesn't become rich. Don't, don't, we, don't we believe that? So which one is it? Should we go through the Herculean efforts to try to become rich? Or we say, well, if God wants me to be rich, he'll make me rich in whatever ways he can. So again, the, these are some of the questions that we can ask. But as we'll see, the sources, the Talmud actually discusses these questions in various ways. So let's look at the first source. The first source is from the book in the Talmud called Brachos, the very first book in the Talmud, in page 60a on the bottom. It talks about going to the doctor. In antiquity, it was quite common for people to engage in a practice called bloodletting. You have too much blood, too much iron, it's dangerous. You gotta let, let go of some of your blood. So they'll go to the doctor, the doctor would take their blood, and, and that would make them healthier. So that's an example of someone going to visit a medical practitioner. Says the Talmud, the first opinion of the Talmud, Rav Acha, someone who goes to the doctor to let, let go of some of their blood, to go, go to a bloodletting session, they should say the following, may it be the will before you, Hashem our God, that this medical practice should actually result in me getting healthier, May you heal me, because after all, you are the reliable doctor, and your healing is a true healing. Talmud tells us there's a certain prayer you say. You're going to the doctor, of course. You're engaging like a human who is trying to pursue their medical interests. Yet, don't forget about God. He truly, ultimately, 
is the doctor. He's the one who's going to provide the healing. And the Talmud gives an addendum. Why? Because it's not the proper way of man to go to visit the doctor. It's only because they thus practiced, only because they practice thusly, must they go to the doctor. So a very cryptic, a cryptic addendum here to, to this idea. When you go to the doctor, you pray, you ask God that this should work, because really it's not so appropriate to go to the doctor. Really, the only reason why they go to the doctor is because they thus behaved. What's going on over here? So that's the, the first portion in the Talmud. The second portion of the Talmud is that no. Comes along Abaya, one of the other sages of the Talmud, says, no, don't, don't say this prayer when you go to the doctor. It's inappropriate. Your position is wrong. Why? Because the verse tells us in Exodus chapter 21, verse 19, verapo yerape, says the Talmud, what that means is that the doctor shall surely heal. This is teaching us that God allows the medical practitioners to engage in medicine. The physician is allowed. God wants the physician to have their say to, 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 be, to be the doctor. So on one hand, the first opinion tells us that we shouldn't go to the doctor. It's really not appropriate because after all, God's the doctor. So everyone's like, no, even God wants us to go to the doctor. So what's going on over here? So I think a good source to really open up this discussion, and I think it'll give us the kernel of what I think is the, is the ultimate resolution to this paradox. It's a comment, a very famous comment by the Ramban, Nachmanides, and his commentary on Torah. In, in Parshas Bechukosai, he says as follows. The rule, the general principle, whenever we hear those words, our ear balls should perk up. When Israel, when they're complete, when they're perfect, and when they're numerous, when the Jewish people are in their proper state, all their matters will not be governed at all by the rules of nature. Not their bodily matters, not their the matters of their land, not in their multitudes, not as individuals. There is a state of the nation in which they don't at all operate under the rules, under the auspices of, of nature. Rather, the Almighty will bless their bread and their water and will remove from their midst all illnesses. They won't need to go to the physician. They won't need to be careful in any matters of, of medicinal practices. Rather, like the verse tells us in Exodus chapter 15, Ani Hashem Rofecha, I'm Hashem, I'm the God who is your doctor. You don't need to worry about it at all. What he's revealing to us, at least initially, we'll see a little bit more, is that there's really, there's really a state of the nation in which they're operating entirely above nature. Nature has no control over them at, at all. In every area of their lives, in their body, in the, in the material, in the land, everything, individuals, multitude, completely controlled, governed by God. And then he adds, and the righteous people in the times of the prophets, when prophecy was still extant, the righteous people would do, when, when, when something bad happened to them, they would try to figure out what is the underlying sin that contributed to this illness. They recognized that the illness is a symptom of a spiritual malady. And therefore, they would go, instead of, you're ill, you got the flu, instead of going to the doctor, you go to the prophet. The prophet tells you what is the sin that is the underlying cause for the symptom, and you fix the underlying cause, and the symptoms go away. That's the way people used to behave. However, and then he quotes the Talmud, what happened was, is that people instead of treating their illnesses on the spiritual level, they downgraded, they demoted their reality to the mere physical. They said, you know what? I'm, I'm sick. I got the flu. And I have, on the right, I have the door of the prophet on the left, I have the door of the doctor. They chose to go to the doctor. By doing that, they gave legitimacy to other physicians outside of God they made real something that really was an illusion. And as a result of that, because they elevated the doctor, the human doctor, 
and they degraded, they downgraded, they demoted the spiritual doctor, the, 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 the prophet. As a result of that, now they need to go to the physical doctor. It's a very deep point that's being conveyed over here. The Talmud says very cryptically, it's not the way of man to seek medical help only because they behaved as such. When the people cut God out of their medical lives, instead of going to the doctor, they used to go to the prophet. They would elevate their life into the spiritual realm. And therefore, even their illnesses, ostensibly their, their, their illnesses to their body, that was just a manifestation of the illness that is present on their soul. And by doing that, they would totally address it on the godly level, so to speak. You go to the prophet, the prophet tells you what's wrong, you fix what's wrong, and the ailment goes away. By downgrading their perspective, their Weltanschauung, and going to the physician, actually they gave legitimacy and credibility to that realm. They themselves were lowered into that realm. They're no longer on that high level. They're no longer that idyllic state of the nation where everything's being governed by God. Now, things are governed by other things. Because they themselves sought normal, what we would call normal, normal resolutions to their pathologies, the pursual of medical care in itself actually prompted the need for said medical care. It's a very deep idea here that he's conveying to us. There's two types of illnesses and there's two types of healings. When the Jewish nation is at their peak, at their apex, and the righteous people in the times of the prophet, the illness even though it was a physical illness, was really a manifestation of a spiritual illness. And thus, the remedy for that was also on the spiritual level. You fix the sin, and the illness, that's the byproduct of the sin, goes away. There's a different kind of illness that demands a different kind of resolution. Once the people started favoring the human physician, they said, okay, well, we're desirous of viewing this illness as just something medical, then you know what? It actually became something medical. Now there's a new kind of illness there, and therefore it demands a new kind of remedy. That's going to the doctor. That's the first opinion here that we see here, that going to the doctor in itself is what caused us to need the doctor in the first place. I think that this is the, this is the core of the resolution to the dilemma, to the paradox. Who's in charge? Is God in charge? Is nature in charge? Why do I get ill? Is it because God wants me to be ill? Or is it because, you know, it's flu season out there and flu season really doesn't discriminate? Well, the answer is, it's not not a fixed answer. It's a dynamic answer. It depends upon the individual. It depends upon how we view the reality of the world in which we live. How much oversight do we get from God? And how much is in our hands? And how much is in the hands of others? The degree of our faith determines the degree of our oversight. If we say we're only going to the spiritual physicians, then we're elevating our life, and God says, oh, I'm going to elevate the oversight that I give you commensurately. And therefore, the illness is only a product of God saying, you know what, there's a message I want to convey, let me give you an illness, you'll, you'll fix the underlying problem and the, and the symptom will go away. By us choosing to say we want to live on a lower level, God says, okay, I'm going to lower my oversight as well. Now you're less subject to God and you're more subject to nature as well. And now you'll be ill for a different reason. You'll be ill because that's the rules of, of nature. I think, I think that's the, the core fundamental resolution. So let's, let's, let's elaborate on this point a little bit. The Talmud tells us, it actually appears in several places, that scripture describes the relationship that we have with God in two very different ways. On one hand, we're told in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 14, of course, this theme appears many places in Jewish scripture, you are sons to Hashem, your God. The relationship that we have with God is filial. He's our father, so to speak. We're his children, so to speak, on one hand. Alternatively, we're described as slaves of the master. For to me are the sons of Israel slaves, the verse in Leviticus Chapter 25 reads, so which one is it? Is the relationship father-son? 
is a relationship of master and slave. Of course, those relationships are very different. The father, you know, has a warm, loving relationship with their child, and the master has a harsher relationship with the slave. Which one is it? Says the Talmud. Bizman Yisrael Ozim Rishon Rishon Makam. In a time when the Jewish people are upholding the will of God, he treats us as children. When we ignore his will, then we suffer the consequences of the recalcitrant slave. We get to determine how God treats us. The more committed we are to upholding his will, the more he treats us as a loving parent. When we upgrade our relationship with him, he upgrades his relationship with us. Talmud tells us that the cherubs on top of the ark in the tabernacle, subsequently the temple, they would swivel. And when things were, were going great, they would look like they were embracing each other. And one of them represents the Jewish people, one of them represents God. When we turn towards God, he turns towards us, and we have this harmonious relationship. We face him, he faces us, and he treats us with that same heightened degree of oversight. In the unfortunate event that we would turn away from God, that would necessarily result in him turning away from us. If we downgrade the way we view him, he downgrades the way he views us. If we lower the amount, the, the, the reality, the, the palpability of his role that he plays in his life, he says, okay, that's what you want. I'll turn away from you as well. And as a result of that, when God turns away, well, who, who determines what happens to us? When there's less godly divine oversight then we are more subject to all the other forces that can determine what happens to us in our lives, namely the rules of nature, namely the whims of other people. If we don't want to be subject to the proclivities of other people, we'd best be advised to make sure that we swivel our proverbial cherub towards God and to the degree that that we swivel to him, he's going to turn towards us. I think with that core idea... Many of the otherwise very challenging citations in the Talmud and in Jewish philosophy and in Jewish experience really fall into place. So maybe the most famous Talmud on this subject is the book of Brachos, page 35b. It records a very interesting debate between two of the sages of the Mishnah, and they're trying to reconcile Seemingly contradicting verses. One verse tells us, Ve'asafta diganecha, you should gather your grain, which is a very famous verse because it appears in the second paragraph of the Shema. When it tells us that we gather our grain, what does that reveal as to our livelihood? It reveals that we're farmers. Farmer plants, you wait uh, six months and then you gather your grain if everything works out perfectly. So God says, if you obey the will of God, things will be great. You'll gather your grain. But included in that is the fact that you are a farmer and you spend some time working the field. That's verse 1. Verse 2 tells us, the book of Torah shall never depart from your mouth. You should never, ever stop studying Torah. If you're a farmer, by definition, you're working the land. And thus, the time that you're working the land, what are you not doing? You're not studying Torah. So which one is it? One verse says, you're a farmer. The next verse says, you're not a farmer because you're studying Torah the whole time. That's the dilemma. That's the contradiction that the Talmud in the book of Baruch's page 35b tries to reconcile. And it gives us two opposing reconciliations. The first opinion is Rabbi Yishmael. The second opinion is Rabbi Shimon, two of the great sages of, of, the, of the Mishnah, of the Mishnahic era says Rabbi Yishmael, the first opinion. He says, well, when it says you should never stop Torah study, it doesn't mean you should never, ever, ever stop studying Torah. It's not literally the book of the Torah should never cease from your mouth. It means most of the time you should be studying, but of course there are some times that you have to work the field. That's a very pragmatic resolution. It's that, well, of, co- of course you have to make a, le- a living. You have to make a livelihood. you got to feed your family. You have to have a field. And that that demands, of course, that you should spend some time working the land. But the rest of the time, 
You should study Torah. And that's the resolution. It doesn't mean you should never, ever, ever stop studying Torah. It means you should, you should make a very high priority in your life. But of course, you're also trying to make a living. You're also gathering in the grain. That's the resolution of Rabbi Ishmael, Rabbi Shmuel. Comes along Rabbi Shimon. And he has a very different resolution to this quandary, to this, to this dilemma. He says the following. What's going to be? A person's going to plow during plowing season, plant during planting season, harvest by harvesting season, grind the wheat during grinding season, winnowing when it's, when it's windy. Your whole life is going to be dominated by your field. Torah, matehele, what's going to be with the Torah? You're never going to study. You're always going to be busy with your field. Rather, his solution is when the Jewish people are doing the will of God, your work will be done by others. When the verse tells us, never stop studying Torah, what it's telling us is that there is a certain kind of time where you're doing the will of God and you study Torah and don't worry about anything else. Don't be a farmer. God will take care of you. God will provide. However, when you choose to cease studying Torah, when you stop obeying the will of God, well, then you know what? You're going to have to be a farmer. You're going to have to work really hard to make your living. Not only that, you're going to have the work of others foisted upon you. The way he reconciles these two verses is that these two verses refer to different kinds of people. The verse in the Shema that says, you gather your grain, you're a farmer. That's talking about someone who is neglecting their mandate, their responsibility to study Torah. And therefore, because you're not doing the will of God, you have to be a farmer. Whereas when the verse tells us that you should never stop studying, what it's telling you is that in that variety of people, you know what? You study Torah and God will provide. The Talmud ultimately concludes, Abayah says, Abayah is one of the sages of the Talmud, many behaved as Rabbi Yishmael taught and succeeded. A lot of people tried both approaches. Many people tried the approach of Rabbi Yishmael to try to harmonize, to try to synthesize being a farmer and also studying Torah. And most of them were successful. And many people try the other approach, the approach of Rabbi Shimon to say, I'm just going to study Torah and the Almighty will provide for me. And you know what? Most of those were not successful. That's the conclusion of the Talmud. It would seem that the two sides of our paradox, on one hand, we're told you got to do something, you got to take initiative. On the other hand, we're told that you have to just, you know, God, of course, is controlling every aspect of your life. It, it would seem like that's the dispute of Rabbi Ishmael, Rabbi Shmuel, and, and and Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shmuel is saying, well, you got to take initiative. You got to be a farmer. You got to plant. And comes along Rabbi Shimon says, no, you don't have to plant. God will provide. You're after all subject to the will of God. And with his oversight, he'll make sure that you're okay. Commentaries point out that there's something deeper going on. You know, if you examine this Talmud, you'll notice that it is very unusual. Whenever there's a debate amongst the sages of the Talmud, every side is going to provide their reasoning and we resolve it based upon the merits of their argument. You bring a source, you bring a Mishnah, you bring a Bryce, you, you bring a logical argument, you quote a verse. There's a legitimate debate between legitimate, reputable rabbis on either side, great Torah giants, and if you want to resolve it, you want to say, well, this opinion is correct, this opinion is not correct, you have to do it based upon the merits of the argument. And here we see that this dispute is going to be resolved with data, with surveying people and saying, well, a lot of people tried this way, a lot of people tried that way, and this way seemed to be more successful than that way. Seems like it's a very unusual way to resolve the argument. How are we mediating? How are we arbitrating this dispute based upon doing a field survey of people who tried this approach? And the people actually, a lot of people tried this and it worked. A lot of people tried that and it worked. It must be the first way is better. What's going on over here? It seems like what's actually happening, and the commentary is elaborate upon this, is that the same idea that we conveyed a little bit earlier from Ramban is present over here. 
There is the idealized way. There is the Jewish people when they're in their, their perfect state, when they're numerous, when they're righteous. There is the righteous people in times of the prophet. And then, of course, there is the reality in which we live, which is more of a sorrier state where people, unfortunately, have chosen to go to the doctor, proverbially, so to speak, have demoted their their divine oversight by changing the, the, the lenses through which they interface with the world. Both of these opinions are both correct. They're not arguing based upon the merits. What they're arguing is actually based upon a pragmatic question. Rabbi Shimon says something which is true, and even his opponent, even his sparring mate, Rabbi Ishmael, agrees that he is correct. If a person is able to follow the advice of, of Rabbi Shimon, to actually say, you know what, I am wholly, completely, truly reliant on God, then they're swiveling the, so to speak, proverbial cherub towards God, and God will indeed respond in kind. And indeed, total reliance on God will result in total oversight by God, and God will take care of you. You're after all his child. You're, you're totally putting yourself in the camp, I want to be the child of God. God will say, okay, for you, I'm going to be totally the father of, of this particular person. And if God is your dad, you don't have to worry about breakfast. He'll take care of you. And therefore, that's true, and everyone agrees that that's true. The problem is there are people who tried it. It didn't work for them. They tried it. They tried to have total reliance on God, but they couldn't quite pull it off. And therefore, they had these niggling doubts. Maybe God won't provide for me. But you know what? They said, ah, I'm going to try it anyhow. And because they didn't fully have the total reliance, they, they were up a little bit at night. They, they, they were tossing and turning. They weren't sure if indeed God's going to provide. That uncertainty resulted in a concomitant reduction in oversight. And therefore, they tried to do it, but they bit off more than they could chew. It didn't work for them. For most people, a better approach is to say, you know what? I'm going to acknowledge the fact that I do go to the doctor, the fact that I do view the reality of nature as being something legitimate, independent of God. And that reduction of faith results in God giving me less oversight. And therefore, I shouldn't try to live by the standards of Rabbi Shimon. I should be more cognizant about who I really am. And therefore, I have to be the farmer because if I'm not the farmer, I'm going to starve to death. Because I'm not quite at the level where I could say, you know what, I have total reliance on God, and therefore he's going to provide me total oversight. And thus, the resolution really fits in. It's not a resolution based upon the merits of the argument. It's a resolution based upon most people really fall into the camp of not having total reliance on God, and therefore not having total oversight by God, and therefore being subject to the rules of nature. And what does the rules of nature say? The rules of nature say, if you don't have a living, if you don't have a livelihood, if you don't have an occupation, if you don't plant, you will starve to death. And you may try to say, well, I'm like Rabbi Shimon, but you know what? You're really not like Rabbi Shimon. And if you try it, you're probably going to fail. And therefore, the resolution actually is a caution of us not to overshoot our Amuna reality. Don't think that we have more oversight than we actually have because our oversight, our divine providence is going to be limited to how much we turn towards God, to how, to, to how much we actually view God as being a benevolent and loving father. And if we try to bite up more than we can chew, if we overshoot that level, then we're going to be left without really much on either side. That's the general resolution. I want to give it a little bit more uh, structure by quoting the Mishnah in Perkei Avos, the Chapters of the Fathers, Chapter 3. It's Mishnah 5 or 6, depends upon how you break down the text. The Mishnah tells us, Rabbi Nechunya ben Hakana Omer, the straight rabbi, says, whoever accepts upon themselves the yoke of Torah, they remove from upon themselves the yoke of kingdom and the yoke of the way of the world, the yoke of Malchus and the yoke of Derech And whoever removes the yoke of Torah from upon himself, 
the yotes of kingdom and the yotes of the way of the world are foisted upon them. What does this mean? We know the word yoke, not the little yellow thing that appears in the egg. Yoke as in the cross piece that is used to attach two animals to a single plow, that is a description of something that a person is subservient to, that someone is subjected to. And the mission reveals to us that a person will invariably be subjected to one yoke or the other. There's no way for a person to not have a yoke. What this is, what this means is that there's something that's on top of them, something that's overseeing them. There's three different kinds of yoke that you can have. You can have the yoke of Torah. You can have the yoke of the kingdom. Or you can have the yoke of Derech of the way of the world. What this is revealing to us is that everyone's going to have some area of life that they cannot shake, that they're subject to. It's like the yoke. There's no way for them to maneuver out of it. Even if they don't like it, they're subject to it. You know, you wonder... Why would a cow or a, an ox spend the whole day walking up and down the field, plowing the field, when it would rather just sit in the shade and, and chew chew grass? The answer is that it's subject to the yoke. There's there's something above it that it is it's limiting it to it. It would love to not have it, but it is just forced to be subject to this oversight, to 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 this control. You know, I always say that people always complain on Mondays. Oh, I got to go back to work. Oh, I hate my job. You kind of wonder, like, if you hate your job, why do you go to your job? Well, the answer is because it's a yoke. You have no choice. Because if you don't go to the job, then you're not going to be able to have the paycheck and you're going to be destitute. And therefore, it's a yoke that you cannot shake. You have to subject yourself to it. What the Mishnah is revealing to us is that there is a way to actually shake yourselves of two yokes by embracing a third one. If someone attests upon themselves the yoke of Torah, what does it mean the yoke of Torah? It doesn't mean that, hey, it's really nice to study Torah. I love it. It's so interesting. It's so enlightening. It's so valuable. It's so wonderful. It's so inspiring. That's not a yoke. A yoke is something that it's to- it's always on top of you. It's always controlling you. Rabbi Shimon tells us, what does it mean to study Torah? What does it mean to have the yoke of Torah? It means that the words of Torah never depart your mouth. Never. It's always upon you. That's the acceptance of the yoke of Torah. If you do that, then the other yokes are removed. The yoke of kingdom and the yoke of derech of the way of the world. What's the way of the world? The rules of the world are, if you don't make a living, you starve to death. But if you don't have that yoke, it doesn't apply to you. If you accept the yoke of Torah in the degree where it's totally completely, comprehensively controlling you, well, then you're completely like the child of God. And you know what? Which parent doesn't provide for their children? Every parent provides for their children. And it'll happen in miraculous ways, but it won't be a miracle because that's not that's not a miracle to you because you don't have that yoke. Only if you have that yoke, only if you're subject to the rules of nature, to the rules of Derech Heretz, only then is it a miracle when miraculously, so to speak, things appear for you. It's not a miracle for Rabbi Shimon. He doesn't have that that reality governing him at all. He's totally subject to the oversight of God, and God will provide for his child. Similarly, the yoke of Malchus. Malchus means kingdom. Kingdom, in this context, means the power of other people. By default, we're all subject to two other oversights in addition to the oversight that we have with God. We have what's described as nature, the rules of nature, and what's described as the free will of others. And most of the time, someone else makes a free will decision that could infringe, could encroach upon your life, could impinge your life, could in- injure you. Why? God doesn't want this to happen. Maybe not. But you know what? You have not accepted the total yoke of God, and therefore God's not totally in charge of you. Theoretically, if you do accept the yoke of Torah, then you're solely subject to him. But if you cast, cast off that, and to the degree that you cast it off, you're subject to the other yokes. Again, you're, you're going to have oversight. The question is, who's in charge? If you totally accept the yoke of Torah, then you're totally removing all the other influences, and no longer are you going to be subject to the will of others. No longer must you work 
to make a living. Very deep idea here. What happens with Abraham? Abraham, someone who, of course, is the, is the, is the paradigmatic example of someone who checked upon himself the yoke of Torah. He was willing to forfeit everything for his faith in God. We know the story. The story is told in the Midrash that he was thrown into the fire by Nimrod because he refused to genuflect to the idol. And what happened? Not a hair on his head was singed. And the way it's explained by the commentaries is along this light. There are rules of nature. What do the rules of nature dictate? If someone is thrown into the fire, they will die. What are the rules of police power of Malchus dictate? That other people who have the, the, the might of the police power, they could determine what happens to you against your will. So we have these two things come together. We have Nimrod, who is the power ostensibly, who is the king, and we have the fire, which rules of nature dictate, burns, consumes, combusts. Abraham's thrown into conflagration, nothing happens to him. Is that a miracle? Is that not a miracle? We would say it's not a miracle. Because it's not a disruption of reality in the reality that Abraham was living in. It was only God in, in, in charge. And God says, I don't want Abraham dead. And no matter what you do to him, he's not going to die. Other people who are somewhat subject to the rules of nature and to the, and to the dominion of others, other people have a say. God may want them alive, but he's not going to intervene necessarily because that would be a miracle. And miracles in that context don't happen. And you know what? If someone relies on the miracle, that also doesn't, that also does not allow for them, uh, for them to have a miracle happen to them. For Abraham, it's not a miracle for us. It would be a miracle. God wants Abraham alive. No matter what everyone else says, the laws of nature, the Derech Heretz, the Malchus, those yotes are no longer in charge of Abraham, and therefore he survives. Us, if we were to be thrown in the same fire, we would die right away. Why? Who's in charge? Is God in charge? Or is the fire in charge? For Abraham, God's in charge. For Abraham, who's totally like the Son of God, who's totally accepting the yoke of Torah, then no other yoke is in charge of him. And consequently, God doesn't want him dead. He survives. We, there is a point in which the yoke of Torah allows for the yoke of the kingdom and of Derech Heretz to still be in top of us, and therefore we're partially controlled by God. Obviously, there is a degree of divine oversight, of personal oversight that we have with God. And there's also a degree in which nature rules us, in which kingdom rules us. And those, those parameters are always changing. Every time we upgrade our relationship with God, the, the, the yoke of Torah is going to nudge away a little bit. We're a little bit less subject to the yoke of nature and to the yoke of kingdom, of free will of others. So again, uh, there's some more sources that, to substantiate uh, this resolution. So for example, the Verse tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 22 that if you have a, a roof in which people go, you have to put a fence around the roof. Why velo sasim damid bebesecha? Don't place blood in your house. Don't allow an accident, someone falling off the roof and, and hurting themselves. Now, the obvious question is, if someone dies, who wanted them dead? God wanted them dead. Well, if someone comes onto my roof and they're having a good time until they collapse and they fall and they die, well, it's not my fault. God obviously wanted them dead. And the same dilemma. So the Sefer Chinuch is one of the earlier commentators who uh, delineates all the mitzvahs of the Torah. He really gets into this question. He says, wait a minute, what's happening over here? Why, pray tell, must I put a fence around my roof? If the person who dies there dies because God wants them dead, then my roof won't help and my roof is superfluous. Yet the verse says, if I don't put a roof on, and someone does die, it's my responsibility. Why would it be my responsibility? So he, again, that's, that's the same dilemma, the same paradox that we have over here. So he addresses it the way, again, the, the way we outlined. He says, yes, of course, everyone is subject to the will of God and nothing happens outside the will of God. But you know what the will of God also includes? The will of God also includes the fact that the rules of nature mandate that accidents will result in fatalities. And he gives some gory examples, like if a boulder falls, falls on someone's head, it's going to crush them to death. And if someone, God forbid, goes into a fire, they're going to die. And if someone falls off the roof of a tall building, they're also going to die. 
And God endowed us with the intellect to avoid these kinds of dangers, and he commanded us to protect ourselves from accidents. Otherwise, if we don't, then you know what? Nature, to whom man is subjected, will do as per the rules if he does not protect from it. Again, the same idea. People are subject to the rules of nature. That's the that's also included in the will of God. And I, God doesn't want me dead, but you know what? I didn't put the fence around the roof. I didn't ha- maintain the adequate safeguards, and now I'm dead, and it shouldn't have happened. This was a preventable accident. And then he adds, however, there are a select few due to their piety, due to cleaving to God's ways, the king desires them. These are the righteous men of yesteryear, men of renown, like our great and holy forefathers, and many of their descendants who came afterwards, like Daniel, Hanani, Michelle, Vazaria, those people, they were not subject to nature. In fact, to the contrary, nature was subject to them. In the beginning of their lives, they also had this mix of who was in charge. The laws of nature were in charge of them. But as a result of their greatness and their ascension of their soul, it was reversed. They became masters over nature. He brings the example of Abraham. Abraham was thrown to the fire, yet not a hair on his head was singed. But then he ends off with a warning, like Rabbi Ishmael and like Abaya, we shouldn't be too confident in saying we're like the men of renown of yesteryear. We're totally subject to God because in that case, we're relying on a miracle and a miracle won't happen and we're quite likely not on that level of the righteous in the times of the of the prophets, of someone who's solely controlled by God, of someone who really views himself as a child of God, of someone who's totally facing their cherub towards God, and therefore we have this mitzvah to put the fence around our roof and everything that's included within that. I want to add one more source here to wrap up the uh, the sources of this idea. A very controversial source, uh, one, one of the great commentaries on the Torah, the Ar HaChaim is commentary to the episode of Joseph and his brothers and the decision that the brothers made, instead of killing him, let's instead throw him into a pit full of venomous snakes. And obviously, the decision of the brothers, this is chapter 37 of Genesis, it's a very perplexing decision. On one hand, they say, hey, let's kill him. And of course, we understand this decision based upon you know, the stature of these people. These people not not just wantonly killing people. They, they believe that Joseph was indeed worthy of capital punishment. Comes along Ruvain and says, well, let's not kill him. I have a better idea. Let's throw him into the pit full of snakes. So first of all, how has Reuben improved the situation? In addition, the brothers themselves, if they believe that Joseph was worthy of capital punishment, why should they give in? Why should they yield? That's the question that Archaim comes to address. So what he says is that the brothers were pretty sure that Joseph was worthy of capital punishment. But you know what? Says Ruvain, maybe you're wrong. Maybe, maybe, maybe we got it wrong. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's really innocent. And what's going to be? You'll say, hey, let's kill him and we'll have a trial by combat here, trial by fire. Let's find out if if he dies. Well, he must have been guilty. But no, maybe he's going to die and he's really innocent and we killed him because we have free will and he's subject to our free will. And therefore, I have a better solution. Let's throw him into the pit. And then if the snakes kill him, snakes don't have free will and the snakes will only kill him if he's guilty because that's after all God deciding that, they, that, that he should die. And the brother said, oh, you know what, well, let's follow that instruction. But what this reveals to us, again, is the same idea, that Joseph, if he was killed by his brothers, we would never know if he was innocent or guilty. Because you know what? Maybe he was subject to their free will, and their free will mandated, or decided, determined that they should kill him, and God wants him alive, but they want him dead, and they killed him. Now, to bring us a level deeper, well, maybe Joseph should have been righteous enough that he would not be subject to their free will. Aha, that's a good question. I have two answers. Sorry, this is deep, deep, deep in the weeds. Maybe the answer to that question is, yes, Joseph is not subject to normal people's free will because he's so righteous. But you know who else is super duper righteous? 
his brothers, and they have the collective free will of the ten brothers of Joseph is greater than the than than, than Joseph's prophylactic avoidance of the free will of his brothers. That's one suggestion. The second suggestion is, you remember, in the story of Joseph, as it continues, Joseph was put in prison, and he met the butler and the baker, and he asks the butler, when you get back to Pharaoh, please invoke my plight and save me. Says the Midrash, Joseph had to languish in prison for two more years because he relied too much on men. Not on God. Maybe that's revealing to us is that Joseph was not someone who fully accepted the yoke of, of God, the yoke of Torah, and therefore there was a little bit of control of the yoke of kingdom, i.e. the free will of others that could have controlled him. But the bottom line that I want to convey here is that this enormous subject, I think there is at least substantial sources, like we, we mentioned, the, the Maharal, the commentary in Perki Avos, uh, this Arachayim, this uh, Sefer Chinuch, the, there's many sources that we're cobbling together, the Ramban, uh, the way he understands the, the Talmud, uh, that do present a, a cogent, a cogent resolution, resolution to this, to this, to this dilemma. Yes, in theory, we could be totally subject to the will of God, provided that we are worthy of it, and the degree to which all these forces have oversight in us, it's, it's ever changing. It's, it's a dynamic equation. And the more we subject ourselves to God, the more we become worthy of having godly oversight. And the more indeed God is the sole determinant of what happens to us. I want to add, again, there's many sources here and I try to shave off as many sources as I can to, uh, make it fit into the time allotted. There is an interesting idea that we find that people who are vulnerable have extra oversight from God. People who are sick, young children, people who don't rely on their own might are people that have more oversight. So for example, the verse tells us in Exodus chapter 22 that we should not torment, we should not oppress the widow and the orphan because if we do oppress them, then they call out to God and God will hear it and will suffer as a result because these people have extra oversight. We would have thought, at least initially, that the widow, the orphan, alternatively the convert, these are people who are weak, who are feeble, who are outsiders. They have no one to help them and therefore God, in his mercy, he picks up the slack of others and he he says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be their, I'm gonna be their advocate. That's how we understand it simply. But the commentaries explained, Ben Abachai amongst others, that because these people don't have others who are typical allies will come to their aid, therefore they're relying more on God, therefore they have more godly oversight, and therefore their cries will be heard more easily. It's not like these people are they, they, magically because you're an orphan, because you're a widow, because you're someone who's a little bit of an outsider, that magically upgrades the amount of oversight. No, because things are bad for you or you don't have people that usually are, are, are likely to stick up for you, consequently, you're someone who relies more on God and you're amplifying the amount of oversight that you have because by definition, the more reliance you have on God, the more he'll make himself, so to speak, worthy of that reliance, the more oversight he will give as a result. And therefore, that's why these people merit that oversight and therefore it's very dangerous to torment them because they have a more direct link to God as a result of more reliance on him. That's the conclusion. That's the last source I want want to mention. But again, the the bottom line that we want to share here is that the reason why it's such a vexing, confounding, troubling, confusing subject is because there's many variables here. It's not just the question of how much is God in charge? How much is nature in charge? Where do those two points meet? Every person, every individual, every community, every people has a different answer to that question and that that answer is always changing because it is us who get to determine how much is God a master of, of us? Is God a father to us? We get to make that choice and the more we upgrade our amuda, the more we upgrade the reality that God plays in our lives – the more God indeed will play more of a reality in our lives and will provide us more of a divine oversight. This was an absolute pleasure to study with you all today. My email address is rabbiwolbe.gmail.com. I look forward to hearing any questions, any comments, 
any feedback and for meeting again to study together in good health and in good spirits.